here's what he says. Jesus says to the Pharisees, healthy people don't need a doctor. Hmm. Sick people do. The first step toward God was understanding and recognizing that we aren't perfect, that we we are lost. And Jesus said, I'm willing to, to leave the 99 who think they're good and go for the one that's lost. Hello, Festo, and welcome back. Hey, Jackson. Good to be back. Yes, um, last time we went over how Jesus confronted the religious leaders um, about the practices, and we talked about the Beatitudes and what are the Beatitudes, what uh, what were the Ten Commandments, what, what, what was the idea, um, God's heart behind the Ten Commandments. So yeah. what are we looking forward to see today? Yeah, we kind of touched on a, a just a just a little snippet into the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, just to see some of the differences between the letter of the law and the heart of God's heart in there. Um, and and so one of the reasons we're looking at these interactions is because so many people see Jesus through the lens of religion, and many people believe that that's the way to God is through a religious expression. And we've seen at this point in the couple of interactions we've gotten is that Jesus didn't come for those who were doing good things. But he did come for people who knew they needed him. And uh, the first step toward God was understanding and recognizing that we aren't perfect, that we we are lost. And Jesus said, I'm willing to, to leave the 99 who think they're good and go for the one that's lost. And and he he uses that parable, he uses that interaction with the Pharisees to really teach them, um, I'm here for the one that was rejected. And that's the person we need to reach out to in mercy and in love. And Jesus does that with Matthew. And we saw that when Jesus called Matthew, he was willing to reach to the one rejected, the tax collector, the sinner, and then willing to sit down and party with them, have fun with them, be real with them. Uh, but the goal was to to uh, give them love, give them acceptance, and call them to to him. And and just exactly what he does. He doesn't avoid people. He calls them to him, even the most uh, the people that others would reject. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I know we we are talking a lot about church um, in our podcast, but how could um, that concept apply to a church? Sure, yeah, it, it applies to, some of those concepts apply to us in a bunch of different ways. Uh, first, for for some of us, maybe we've never trusted God in faith. And so, understand that Jesus wants to reach out to the, the one. He wants to, he cares about those that are, that are broken, that are hurting, and, and that we cannot earn our way to heaven. And so, for the person who's trying to earn their way to heaven, to realize that it's faith in in God that is what what God's looking for. He's looking for someone who is willing to trust Him and believe in Him and accept Him. Um, and for, and for the person that feels like they're so broken that God would never want them, Jesus does. This is exactly who He came for was was for for us that are broken, for us that are hurting, and uh, and then in another way that applies. Um, just in the in the church itself, to think that doing religious stuff to feel good about ourselves or to make things feel uh, spiritual or feel holy or doing doing spiritual things doesn't bring us to God. In fact, it misses the whole heart of Jesus. Instead, it's important to start by recognizing our areas of need. And seeking God's help in our need, in our brokenness. And that'll change the way we look at other people. Uh, doing religious things or having things in, done in a spiritual way often gets us to the point where we judge people that aren't doing it the same way. When the heart of God is to say, I want to accept and I want to reach out to, to people who are different, people who are rejected, people who are outcast. And so if we can realize... It, it's not about us doing things the right way for God. It's instead us embracing God, accepting his love, and then responding with his love to others. It will change the way we look at other people. 
uh, and once we recognize that we we come to God in our need and instead of our strength, then when we look at other people, we're going to look to give them our love in their need rather than expect them to meet our standard. And I think that changes it changes the whole perspective, the way we go about um, our relationship with God as well as our relationship with other people. Yes, uh, definitely. Now, it's easy to get focused on being comfortable with the 99 and feeling good about our own religious expression. But sure. I don't think that is what Jesus would want us to do. Yeah, look at the... Read the Gospels, read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then some of the, the writers, Peter, as he wrote in the New Testament, but interacted with Jesus throughout his life. And you get a different picture than being comfortable. <laughs> I don't think anyone who walked with Jesus was comfortable. Uh, they, they had a radical approach to life. Many of them lost their lives because they, they laid their safety and security on the line to be willing to reach people that the world had rejected. And, and so Jesus, I, I see Jesus calling us to have radical love for those around us, just like Jesus did, just like you see in the interactions he had with people, calling the tax collector, calling Matthew, meeting the woman at the well who was a Samaritan. Everyone hated, and then she had an immoral life, and Jesus draws her in. The, the woman that was found in adultery is doing a, a, something that the religious community around rejected her for, wanted to trap her in, um, probably set the whole thing up to trap her and to trap Jesus. But Jesus calls her to him and says, you can have a new life, you can have hope, and he, and he gives that to her. Um, Jesus calls us to a radical approach to life to love the people around us, to care for the people around us, to be willing to go for that one and not be comfortable with the 99. And, and it's, it's easy to get stuck in, here's what we've always done, here's what we like, here's what we think uh, honors God, at the same time ignoring the people around us that don't know God. And Jesus came for the one that was missed. Yeah. Now, so we've seen some example, a few examples of Jesus' um, Jesus interaction with the religious. Can you think of some more? Yeah, there's so many. We couldn't, we certainly uh, couldn't touch them all, um, and we're we're only really hitting hitting a few. But one one of the instances of Jesus' interaction with religious uh, the religious community is a, surrounds the idea of Sabbath. Sabbath, the Ten Commandments uh, say that you should not do any work on the Sabbath, which is a, the idea is behind God and the day and the time of creation on the seventh day of the creation. Right. He, he, he wasted it so. That's, we should not do any work. Yeah, it was written in the Old Testament law, so that hit is not currently in effect for today and for the church. And that's a whole other topic for another time. But in Jesus' day, they observed the Sabbath, which was the Saturday, our Saturday, seventh day of the week, final day of the week. Um, just like God finished creation on the seventh day, he rested. And, and that, that example was carried into the Old Testament law and codified in the Ten Commandments, like you mentioned. And so they had a Sabbath day of rest. Then Israel had bigger than that, <clears throat> so they not only had the seventh day to rest, but every seven years they were to rest and give their land a rest. And then every seventh seven years, so you're 49 years, they had, a, they had an even more special year of rest, and that was the, the year of Jubilee. And so they would set free people's debts. They would give the land a rest. They would give back to the community. And uh, Israel, over time, started to stop celebrating these periods of rest. Mm -hmm. uh, Sabbath day, Sabbath year, the, the year of Jubilee, and they, they just kind of let them slide. And that was one of the issues. It's not the only issue, but it was one of the issues that was a reason for God kicking them out of the land and from not observing the uh, the Sabbath. And, and they, they started to focus on work, started to focus on doing their own thing for their own benefit uh, rather than giving back. And and uh, that was one of the things that that led to them getting kicked out of the land. 
Yeah, so if it was um if this was one of the problem that the uh, that led uh, the people of Israel to be kicked out of the land, what I'm thinking is the Pharisees they would not be uh, you know happy about you know somebody who is not observing the Sabbath. Sure, because yeah. they wouldn't the concern was not to be kicked out of the land. Right, yeah, that was one of the things they were really focused on. Let's do it right this time. We're not gonna mess up like our ancestors did. Uh, so they would have been very concerned about the Sabbath, and they didn't want to break that. So what they did, it, historically, was then to add rules around the Sabbath to make sure no one would break the Sabbath. So it wasn't enough to just say, we need to rest on the seventh day. They came up with a number of different rules to say, here's what work is, and here's just what you can't sure do. to make sure that you did not break the Sabbath. Right, <laughs> to make sure you didn't break the Sabbath. Uh, so r rabbinical writings that we have today, we have the Mishnah and the Talmud and, and a bunch of other rabbinical writings, and they argue about these things of what constitutes work, what are some rules around it, what keeps someone from working. They come up with 39 different categories of work, mm and then rules around each one of those 39. So you end up with hundreds of rules around one single commandment. <laughs> the commandment not to work on the Sabbath. Mm. Hundreds of world, or hundreds of rules. Yeah, you, you better stay inside of your house so you don't, you don't mess up the Sabbath. For yeah. The yeah. So well, in a practical sense, so on a daily basis, so what, what, did they, what did that look like? Or, or, yeah, I can I can give you a couple examples. We'd probably be here all night, Jackson. <laughs> Look at all of them. Uh, one thing they weren't to do was carry. So that was one of their categories. They couldn't carry things. And in the Bible, there's an instance where someone was was uh, collecting firewood on the Sabbath, and it was considered work. So then they took that to the next level and said, well, you, well if you can't collect firewood, you can't do any any carrying, you just can't carry anything. And so they would say, you, you, even in the rabbinical writings, they, they pinned it down to such things as you can't carry something in the street, uh, you, can't, you can't carry a key or a handkerchief or a keychain. I mean, these are some of the things that are in their, in their rules. Or a pocketbook, a purse, even a wallet. If you carry any of those things, just in your pockets, <laughs> you're actually breaking breaking the Sabbath. And and so the, they would argue about this in the rabbinic writings, and they believed, they believed that the spirit of that law, were not working on the Sabbath, was, and this one specifically carrying, that you couldn't carry anything, like nothing. That would be the spirit of the law. But it, what I find is interesting, they go on to argue in the writings that, that Although they all believed the spirit of the law was no carrying whatsoever, mm -hmm. that actually they would specify it's it's not good if you carry anything in public, but it is okay if you carry something in private in your own home. Mm -hmm. So they, they kind of codified it's okay to break. We all believe you can't do it at all, but if you're going to break it, break it at home, inside your house. <laughs> just don't do it in public. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was just just one area Another area was is walking. So, Jackson, you mentioned maybe better to just stay in your house. Well, they specified you couldn't walk more than a half a mile or you'd be breaking the law of working. And, and so they even put that out to a number of steps that you could take on the Sabbath before it'd be considered work. Uh, I bet they wish they had a Fitbit back then because that could that could track their steps and they'd know exactly where they're at. Um, they'd go on to, there'd be a category of no cooking, mm -hmm. a category of no building a fire. Mm -hmm. And that one, they, they pin it down to even, you can't even throw a toothpick into the fire. And if you throw that toothpick into the mm -hmm. fire, you're working on the Sabbath. Um, 39 areas many, many rules around those areas, it was nearly impossible to not break the Sabbath according to the, the Pharisaic rules. And the Pharisees in that time, they claimed perfection, so they claimed that they didn't break the Sabbath, and then they would judge everyone else for breaking the Sabbath, uh, but they'd claim that they could do it. And I, and I, I look and read all that. You, 
how could you live and not, yeah. not break one of those rules? Sounds like impossible. Oh, it's, it's probably an understatement to say not breaking the Sabbath was very important to the Jewish leaders. So how did mm -hmm. does how does Jesus run into this? Yeah, yeah, it, a bunch of different occasions Jesus runs into it. So one specific occasion is Matthew chapter 12. And uh, Jesus is in, his disciples and him are walking through a grain field. It's on the Sabbath. Uh, I'm sure they have their Fitbits out and they're tracking how many steps that they're walking. Uh, but they're going through the grain field and, they, and the Pharisees see the disciples pick some grain from the field. And they eat some kernels of grain. And here's what the Pharisees say. Here's this interaction. Uh, Matthew 12, verse 2. It says, Some of the Pharisees saw them do it. They saw them pick that those pieces of grain and they protested. And, and the Pharisees say, Look, your disciples are breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath. <laughs> so picking a few heads of grain <laughs> was harvesting? I Yeah, I guess so. And probably in the rules around the Sabbath, they might have specified how many heads of grain you had to pick before it was considered work. Um, but but that was the that was the instance. They picked the grain. The Pharisees are all on them for you. You broke the Sabbath. Um, it, it, one of the categories in the rules around the the Sabbath was harvesting, and it specified all parts of harvesting from picking all the way to binding. And so they're nitpicking this one area of they pick some kernels of grain. Oh oh boy, <laughs> not not that you couldn't eat on the sabbath you could eat on the sabbath but you can't pick anything and interesting in the rules it says you couldn't even pick up fallen fruit so not even like harvesting the fruit where you go up on the tree you climb up and you harvest it well you couldn't even pick the fallen fruit off the ground and then in the in the rule for carrying right they said in the private residence you could you could carry but when it comes to harvesting, even if it's your private garden or even if it's in your house, you couldn't you couldn't pick, uh, you couldn't harvest. So they were very extreme on the on the picking, and that comes out in this interaction with the with the disciples. And as we're thinking about this, you got to remember that none of these rules, none of those thirty nine categories, none of the rules around them come from the Old Testament yeah. text. None of them come from the from the scripture they with themselves, yeah. Right. Yeah, it's built into those rabbinic writings. Um, and so Jesus responds to all this and he responds to the Pharisees by by citing David from the Old Testament. He brings up the example of David when David went into the tabernacle and the priest gave him the bread that was meant for the worship of God. It wasn't mm -hmm. meant for consumption of people outside of the tabernacle. It wasn't meant for anyone other than the priests. But the priests were more concerned with David's hunger than they were the letter of the law. And, and so Jesus uses that example and says, well, David's hunger was more important. It's not about the letter. It's about the heart. It's about the need of the person. Jesus will then go on to cite another example, and he'll cite the law of Moses that says priests are allowed to work on the Sabbath. Jesus basically says, well, your own professionals are allowed to work on the Sabbath. The priests work on the Sabbath. One of the most surprising statements in the whole chapter, verse 6, Jesus says this, There is one here, and he's, it's him and the disciples and the Pharisees that are there questioning him, there's one here, he says, who is even greater than the temple. Now, the temple was a big deal. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Israel, Israel believed in that they were okay as long as they had the temple, the land, and the law. That was like their big three. Mm -hmm. So the temple's a big deal. Jesus has been driving at the heart of the law, saying, well, it's not about the letter. David, it was about his hunger. Mm -hmm. Um You've, you've got people even in the law that are allowed to work. The priests are allowed to do that. What's the, what's the focus here? What's the heart of this? And then he says, but there's, there's one here that's even greater than the temple, even greater than the thing you look at as the most important. And then Jesus goes on to cite, again, the Old Testament prophets, like we looked at a couple times. And, and this quote keeps coming up. He cites the Old Testament prophets. Again, they were... They were talking to Israel 
before Israel got kicked out of the land and they were trying to get Israel back to the heart of God, back to the heart of God so that they wouldn't be kicked out. Jesus cites that same passage here and he says that they needed to understand, like they wouldn't condemn the disciples if they understood, and what was was the verse, Mm -hmm. to give Mm -hmm. mercy, not not sacrifice. sacrifice. Right, (laughs) right. So he drives right back at that central point that it's it's about your heart and how you treat other people Mm. so in this instance it was more important that the disciples took care of their physical need Mm. their hunger than it was to worry about the letter of how many kernels they picked Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, jesus's next statement though probably really hit home and jesus says the son of man is lord even over the Sabbath. It didn't make them okay because they had the land, the law, and the temple. That does, Just because they had those three things doesn't make them okay. Jesus drives, in his comments here, he drives right at the law and the temple. There, there's one here who's greater than the temple. There's one here that's actually greater than the law. Than the law. Yeah. <laughs> it's greater than the Sabbath. Yeah. And you guys yeah. are all worried about the letter of the law. Jesus could say, I wrote it. <laughs> now, is, is that where it ended? Like, no no more discussion? Like, did they really actually get it and actually... <laughs> yeah, uh, Matthew doesn't record any comeback. <laughs> they, don't, they don't really have any comeback, but the day itself wasn't over. So the same day, Jesus... Jesus gets up. He's not finished yet. He goes to the synagogue. And and so we have this instance where they talk about the Sabbath, and then Jesus goes and he he interacts on the Sabbath. And so same chapter, uh, Matthew 12, Jesus goes into the synagogue on on Sabbath. And, and over time, Sabbath originally a day of rest, eventually over time in the, in the religious system, it became a day to focus on God, and that's not a bad thing at all, to pray, to learn, to worship, to come together. And again, none of those things are bad. They weren't originally set up in the Old Testament law, but it came to be that as a time when they could rest from the weekly labor and put their emphasis on who God is. Great, great thing. Jesus goes to the synagogue and he immediately sees a man who has a need. A man with a deformed hand. And in that chapter, he, he walks into synagogue and his eyes must have just met this guy who's got, he, he can't use his hand. It's all withered up. It's deformed. Um, he can't perform probably some of the labor that would have been necessary just for his own survival. And Jesus locks eyes. Now, what did, he do, what did he do to the man? Did he heal the man? Yeah, well, yeah, it, the, the Pharisees confront him first. So what's interesting is the Pharisees must have seen the man immediately too. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Maybe they planted him there. Probably not. I don't think that happened. But but the Pharisees see the man and they see Jesus looking at the man. And, and so they, they ask him. It's almost like they knew Jesus had the power to heal him. And that Jesus had the heart to heal him because they see their eyes. They see Jesus looking at him. And so they ask him right away, they say, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And uh, they're they're really asking, is it okay to work? Mm -hmm. Because their view is healing, you're changing changing that person. You've now fixed their hand. You're obviously doing something. It's got to be work. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so this is a trap. They're trying to trap Jesus. Is it? They're trying to get Jesus to give them an immediate yes, and then they can come back and say, "Well, you don't agree with the Sabbath. You don't think it's okay to rest like God commanded us. Um, you're in disagreement with the law of God." And so they're using this to trap him. Jesus will go on and he he gives them an object lesson right out of their culture, agricultural rural area and Jesus gives them an object lesson that says if you had a sheep so Matthew 12 if you had a sheep that fell into a well on the Sabbath it it was walking along sheep's going along all looks good it's a field but there happened to be an old well there that no one could see anymore and and but that's the hole's still there and the sheep's walking along it falls into the 
falls into the well. And it's down yeah. at the bottom, bleeding away, yeah, what uh, calling do, again. Right? <laughs> what would you do, right? Yeah, if it fell into a well on the Sabbath, wouldn't you, wouldn't you work to pull it out? Jesus asked them that question. How many farmers wouldn't save yeah. their animal? Yeah. Right? If, uh, if my dog, I, I don't have a sheep. I don't really yeah. want a sheep. Sheep are not real smart animals. Yeah. Uh, but uh, if my dog got hurt, I would immediately try to help it out of my compassion and and we as people tend to have compassion on defenseless animals mm -hmm. we do and jesus pins them down here and it's this rhetorical question like yes of oh, course yeah. of course he would jesus goes on to say this he says yes the law permits a person to do good on the sabbath so he told them that the heart of the sabbath the heart of god wasn't following a bunch of fools uh, to restrict life, but that God's heart was to to do good, you know, to to care about people. Because, yeah. uh, 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 like I, I like this uh, statement because actually someone is more important than an animal than a sheep. You know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We would have compassion on the sheep, right? We'd have compassion on the the poor animal, and yet the Pharisees are standing there saying, "Don't you dare." <laughs> don't you dare heal him. Don't help a person. We'd help a sheep. It, and I don't, I think they're thinking through that. So then they come out of this and really judge Jesus for it. But, but if they had the, the heart to look inside, they'd have to say, so I'd have more compassion for a sheep than I would a man. Yeah. And why is that? What's wrong with my heart? <laughs> yeah. But obviously they, they judged now, Jesus. Now, right more. after that, how did they respond? So how did the Pharisees react? Sure. Yeah, well, the thing is, Jesus doesn't stop with the, with the words, right? Mm -hmm. He says this, yes, it is good to do good on the Sabbath. So the Sabbath is for doing good. The heart of God is for good. And so Jesus doesn't leave it at that, though. He goes out and he heals the man. So, and then, then the reaction is after that. But I, I relate that back to what he had just said. So the, the, the disciples picked the kernels of grain. Jesus said, there's one here that's greater than the temple. There is the Son of Man who is greater than the Sabbath. He goes in, is it lawful to work on the Sabbath? Is it lawful to heal the man? And Jesus says, yes, it is lawful to do good and I am Lord of the Sabbath, <laughs> and I'm going to heal. And he does it. I'm not going to follow your authority. I'm going to do the heart of God. I'm going to I'm going to do good. I'm going to help this man. I'm going to heal him, make his hand well. And we really don't hear, for, hear about this person later. It's this instance for God's glory to shine. He illustrates God's heart for people. And their their answer is let's let's take him out. Um, he is shaking things up. He's taking away the rules that they had. He, it's going to hurt the way they look to other people. He's challenging their authority, and he's taking away the the ability they have to judge other people. And that's got to stop. They're they're having none of that. Um, Jesus even had the power to prove his authority because he healed the man. I mean yeah. he he can do it. And and they don't they don't want any of this, and so they go on to plot how to kill him. Well, Matthew goes on to tell us a little bit more, and, and Matthew is as he th thinks back about all of that. Matthew remembers a point from Isaiah way back in the prophets, as Isaiah was prophesying, looking toward the Messiah, looking toward that person would, who would come. And so Matthew, right in this chapter, quotes Isaiah one of Isaiah's prophecies. And Matthew says uh, that this servant of God is going to come, this messenger who's sent to Israel. And, and Matthew quotes the passage talking about that in Isaiah to say, that's him, Jesus. He's the one. He's Lord of the Sabbath. He's the one that's greater than the temple. He's the representative sent from God. He's God's servant. He's the Messiah. And, uh, and Matthew points that out. Uh, Jesus is the very one the Pharisees were waiting for. He's the very one the whole religious community wanted to show up. 
But now that he's here and he's not saying the things that they want him to say, they want him out of the picture. <laughs> and uh, and so that this interaction, I mean, Jesus, Jesus is the very one that they wanted, and they're the ones that knew all the passages, they knew all the the scriptures, they knew all the references, they knew the prophecies, they had all the knowledge, but they couldn't see it. They couldn't see who he really was, and they rejected the very person they wanted. Yeah, and I, mean, I remember at the beginning of this um, season that we talk about Jesus being a controversial very controversial yeah. figure, but even in his yeah. in his time, he yeah. was a controversial I figure. I for yes. sure because if Christ was to be the person they were waiting for, looking forward to see, and now he was not uh, agreeing with them uh, on the yeah. Sabbath. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they expected him to come back, put his stamp of approval on everything they did, and kick out the Romans. That's what that's what they wanted from the Messiah. Uh, to say, our system is great, I'm behind you 100%, let's get rid of the Romans. Uh, but that's not what Jesus came for. He came for the one who was rejected. He came for the one who was lost. He came for the sick to be the doctor and to bring salvation to the world. And and so we're, we've been looking at, at part of this interaction, and we don't, we, we kind of missed the entire thing, but if you look a little bit further in this chapter, in Matthew chapter 12, in verse 24, the Pharisees go on to claim that Jesus, Jesus' power is actually coming from the devil. Uh, so they're not ready to recognize it's coming from God. They see the power. They can't deny it. So then they, they throw up a straw man. Well, yeah, he can do some great things, but it's because it's, it's evil power. And so Jesus will interact back again and, and indicate, well, the devil doesn't work against himself, and Jesus had just cast out a demon, and so I'm not going to, I can't take evil power and cast out evil. That doesn't even make sense. And then Jesus, he, he, uh, he again confronts, confronts the, uh, confronts the Pharisees and goes on to say that if you're not standing with him, you're actually standing against him and makes this dividing line. And in his teaching, the heart is what mattered for the dividing line. What matters is what we believe, what we believe about who Jesus is. Not just in our head, but our complete self. It matters what we embrace, and uh, and it matters what is inside. And so Jesus in the chapter, as you look at the whole chapter, Matthew chapter 12, he'll go on to talk about what is inside, what what is a part of what we embrace as a person, mm -hmm. what's in our in our heart, what we embrace. And I know that's not a pumping thing. It's not about blood. It, it's about our entire being and what we embrace as a person, what we believe. And, and he says that what's inside is what's going to come out. So if we, if we have, if we have bitterness inside, that's what's going to come out. If we have, if we have goodness inside, if we have love inside, if we've embraced God's love as a part of who we are, then what's going to come out will be good, both out of our mouth and and our our action. And uh, so he's interacting with the the religious community, and so many of them were angry. They were full of pride. They were full of judgment. And so the fruit that came out, what came out from the inside, was evil, mm -hmm. was harshness. And uh, and so Jesus calls them out in verse 34, again, Matthew chapter 12. Uh, there's there's these interactions all the way through Matthew 12. It's, it's packed full of interactions with the, uh, with the religious leaders. And Jesus, in, in verse 34, calls them out. And he says, you brood of snakes. <laughs> you brood of snakes. Some translations say brood of vipers. Mm -hmm. He said, how could evil men like you speak what is good and right? <laughs> For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. Yeah. What's inside, what you embrace, what you believe, that's what's going to come out. That's what you're going to say. And as, as I looked at just the background of this passage, that phrase, you brood of snakes or you brood of vipers, that was a common phrase of the day. And what it meant in their culture was people that were filled with anger and bitterness. And that's what Jesus was saying about the religious leaders. You are full of anger and bitterness. Mm. 
Well, well, that you... was a very severe <laughs> a statement, a very yeah. scathing uh, evaluation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jesus wasn't making any friends here. <laughs> he was. He yeah. was calling them out. Uh, he was saying, "What matters most is what's inside." And how could anything good come out of you if what is inside is so dark and bitter? And when anger and bitterness is in the heart, good can't come out. It, it can't come out. Um, but the beauty is when God is in control, when, when God is in control of the heart, when we fully embraced God as our, as our Father, as, as the one who loves us, the one who's given us salvation, when we embrace who Jesus is and seek to accept that love and then spread that love, um, the result is good. Yeah. The thing is, religion can't change the heart. Religion can only change the outside action. Mm -hmm. But what matters is the inside first. Mm -hmm. And in, it's, not, it's, it's not do good so we earn God's favor. It's not so we can do enough good to gain that favor. Mm -hmm. It's accept God, embrace Him, and He transforms the heart. He transforms us from inside to out. And the result is good. But the order matters. It can't be... It can't be change the outside action and then that will change the heart it has to be accept and embrace god and accept his his forgiveness and he will transform us from the inside out wow. so remember that first step is to understand we're not perfect to understand we are we are sinful that we did fall short that we need help that <laughs> we're just broken people and that's that first step to embracing God's forgiveness and His transformation inside out. Oh, Pastor, well, thank you very much. It seems like the more we're getting into it, the better it gets. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's it's so, been fun. It's been yeah, fun. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Now, do uh, just to wrap up, so do you have any book for us, like for this episode? Sure. Yeah, I, uh, I, as we've been going through, we've just been hitting some bunch of interactions from Matthew. We talked. Matthew chapter 9 last week, Matthew chapter 12 this week, and we've kind of hit some interactions from Matthew. So I, I love this book from uh, Michael Card. You might remember, some of you might know, he's a singer, he's a songwriter. Um, music's a little older now, but it is good. And a lot of good worship music that he's written. Um, yeah, I think I've been to one of his um, concerts. Uh, sure, too. yeah, I, I've been to one concert of his. I, I've sang a lot of his music in church over the years. Uh, but an excellent songwriter, but part of the reason his songs are so so piercing and so accurate to the core is because he is just a student of Scripture. And he has a theological education, and he loves to get into the background of the Jewish culture and, and unpack how that it just brings to life the biblical passages. And this is one of his books on the book of Matthew. And uh, he, it's the, the gospel of identity. It, it shows who Jesus is as a, as a, uh, a person to the, to the people of Israel. And, uh, and so Michael uh, really brings the passages to life. And it's a, it's a great look at the book of Matthew. And I'm sure you'd enjoy it if you want to dig in a little further. Yes, definitely. Yeah, so how do we wrap up today so we can, what should we expect for next episode? Now we're going to dig into one last interaction. So yeah. kind of get, get one last one in, in the religious community and then we'll move on from there and, and look at some of uh, some of the things Jesus taught. Yeah, exciting. Definitely. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor. All right. Thanks, Jackson. Yeah.